Hello, and welcome to More Intelligent Tomorrow, a wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. When does model accuracy equal human lives? We'll discuss this and more with Ashwani Dev on today's episode. And now, your host, Ben Taylor. Ashwani, thanks for joining us this morning. Yeah, thanks for the invite. It's, it's such a pleasure to be, you know, with you and, and talking to you and sharing thoughts. So, uh, yeah, it was a blue moon in white. So, you know, those surprises, you you really want to hold on to that. So, thanks for that. Yeah, well, I'm excited to uh, hear from some of your experience. It doesn't look like you have as much gray as I have. Uh, maybe you haven't made as many mistakes as I have in my career. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think we can debate that, and and you know my my wife has a different opinion about that. But uh, but let's say we give you advantage that you have you know more uh, white hair than me, so we can we can live with that. <laughs> well, I, I want to hear your backstory. So, what? How did you find your find yourself working for Halliburton, or what inspired you to go into geophysics? Uh, one of my friends, actually, he was, he went for a geophysics program to in you uh, IIT Roorkee, which is Indian Institute of Technology Roorkee. And I called him one day, you know, uh, what do you do? What is geophysics? And and he said, you know, uh, one thing I don't know, but if you get a job, you get you make a lot of money. I said, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> so once I went there, that was first year. I was you know first semester studying geology, geophysics, and I couldn't understand anything because it was all about you know, rocks and falls and faulting, and I've never seen something like that, so can't figure out what's going on. Uh, and uh, in the first year, uh, after the first semester, there was a geology field trip which took us to Himalayas, and, and that was fascinating, and that opened my eyes, and I said, yeah, this is what I want to be. This is where I want to be. I like mountains. I like being outside. I want to explore the world. And I think, so that accident actually gave became a natural choice for me. And I said, yeah, this satisfies all my criteria. I don't want to be what everyone wants to do, but I also want to be closer to the nature. And that's that's how it started. So, so yeah, nothing planned. And so it was, it, was an, uh, it was an accident. And then my Halliburton career was a second accident that happened. So uh, when I was graduating, my plan was to straight away go to a graduate school to do a PhD in geophysics. Actually, I wanted to be an oceanographer. So I was planning to go to uh, University of Sydney to to try to uh, join the oceanography program. I was applying there, and, and then Halliburton came to our campus. I was going to say real quick for our listeners, what do you do? What does an oceanographer actually do? I think that's a discipline people aren't familiar with. Yeah, so uh, so basically, what oceanographers do is they uh, they basically look at the ocean currents. They understand the waves. Then you are in like uh, uh, navies and other places you go where there you are trying to understand the uh, sonar channels where basically how the velocity, how the signals are uh, basically traveling uh, after a few meters below the below the sea level. So uh, so yeah, so that was my dream, and and that's where I was planning to go. And the uh, final semester, Halliburton came and. They interviewed a bunch of guys, including me, one of them. And I just went in casually and later and find out they, they selected me. So so that, so joining Halliburton initially in 2001, that was another accident, which I was not planning to do. But uh, eventually I worked for a year, uh, a year and a half, and then I left my job again. I went to do gra I went to graduate school to do PhD. And then I think since then I have never looked back and more and more I went deep into geophysics and geosciences and oil and gas and that's how. So maybe to pull on that thread, I, I think this is something that younger listeners, they want to aspire to emulate exact, exactly what you've done, but it sounds like your career has been, you know, there's been some randomness, a lot of things weren't planned and you are where you are today, but what competencies and advice would you give your younger self or to people that are listening? So if I'm 19 years old, I'm starting off in my career. What are the, some high-level topics or advice you'd give? Uh, so I think the first thing, uh, what I have learned from my experiences is that if you think something you are very passionate about, uh, irrespective of what you know, 10 other people are telling you that that is, that is the norm and that is what everyone is doing and you should be doing it, 
and if you are not totally into it and your mind and your brain it tells you otherwise you should go and explore that so it's never a bad thing to do uh, the second thing is that is one uh, that's a starting point but what happens is that uh, life gives you a lot of curveballs and and when it those curveballs comes in either you duck or you hit all the two things you can do in your life so my personal experience has been i was i have always been a, a hitter so if if a curveball comes in i try to deal with it i learn new things i am ready to roll up my uh, my sleeves and trying to understand yeah can i do it and i if i'm not i definitely wants to do it because i want to learn something new so that 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 curiosity that drive to to learn something new as you move on i think those are the two things which have been the primary driver and and rest of the things you know they fall in place so so why do you think so many ai projects are failing in the industry so outside outside of your company so many projects that i have seen is people largely uh, get into it as a poc but not a real intention to drive a change and 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 that's where i have seen the biggest because drive if you are saying it is going to drive a change that it means it is this project if you're taking it up it is going to have a realistic implication on the business how you do business and if the project has no implication on how you do business or how your business is business processes basically within an organization uh, i don't think they are going to be successful and this is most of the cases where i had discussion where those initiatives have not moved forward uh, this has been the real case yeah well you remind me of an important point a lot of ai feels experimental where they don't have the long vision um about it being applied in, in the life cycle that going to production it feels like a one off or you know it's in a jupyter notebook or kind of in a lab setting i think most of the things are are that way actually and uh, uh, the reason being that everyone wants to i think it's a kind of a kind of a fad to be in ai and and so everyone wants to do it uh, whether uh, means everyone has a toolbox that's how i see it yeah but everyone not everyone is ready to solve a problem everyone is running to solve all the problems and when you're trying to solve all the problem you're not going to solve any problem so so yeah. this is what i have seen so i think the the toolbox is basically is the fad right now and it's inside and outside it's not just you know you cannot say that you know the companies who are providing the services and and solution they have it is that it's that same fad lives within any organization where they have people so uh, people wants to apply it without uh without considering or talking to the business that you know let's do something which is changes the way we do things and 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 think in a in a bigger way how it how it impacts the other place which is very uh personal to me and uh, i'm trying to spend quite a lot of time in that is healthcare uh so my mother she passed away uh, 3 years back and uh, around 2 and a half and uh, Uh, she died of acute kidney failure uh, and uh, so i stayed with her in the hospital for one and a half months and that was uh, quite an experience for me uh, not only that because my mother was sick but it was i saw a lot of patients who had kidney problems and especially in india and how they suffer and one of the thing that i realized was and after that uh, after my mother passed away actually i wanted to study more and understand about the uh, acute kidney failures and understand what is out there uh, can you identify acute kidney failure are there symptoms that can help you identify it and uh, because even in us uh, i think yearly it's close to 1.4 million people die because of kidney failure so uh and in uh, other part of the world it's even more acute uh so then i realized that till your kidney started malfunctioning there is nothing that you can do basically there is no precursor symptoms uh that basically directly points you towards that your kidneys are going to 
are going to malfunction or there is a problem with them uh, other than that the uh, high blood pressure and the sugar problems and so those are basically becomes a precursor uh, event saying that if you have these problems you have a high probability that in future you will have a kidney problem and the other part is if you have a kidney problem uh, people don't understand what are the solutions there especially when i'm talking about india and not not over here and since then i think what I have i have been working uh, is to understand ways uh, if we can develop a uh, develop a system uh, based on patients regular history blood work urine work or or, or all the uh, diagnose diagnostic rules that exist in the medical and the clinical history and to see is there a, is data can data point to something which can tell you that uh, uh, maybe like a probabilistic models that can based on your 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 current ongoing you know uh, uh, symptoms or your diagnosis like a yearly exam you know collecting yearly exam for the last five years and try to analyze that and come up with a probabilistic model that why kidney means what or potentially what can happen to kidney when you take those the same data from uh, people who have currently acute kidney failure so so in short means my mother's death kicked something in me and and transformed me to to really look into this problem and i think since then i became very much involved in understanding this particular problem uh, advising companies who uh, startups who are in healthcare so there are two three companies who are doing some uh, really good work uh, and i'm i started working with them and got a lot more involved in not an official basis but as as a passion for myself in in this so so i think that's where my most of the time now goes i'm realizing ashwani that we have a lot of funny overlaps so my dad was a doctor i became an engineer a chemical engineer with plans to go into the oil industry and i have an 11 year old daughter and an eight year old son and a six year old son and my wife has chronic kidney disease so i'm very passionate about using data analysis to, to predict kidney I'm disease but le yeah. luckily she's remained constant but she is yeah. still undiagnosed she's had a kidney biopsy it's been 15 years she's running at 40 percent uh i think creatinine clearance or whatever the metrics are but from a data perspective, it's very upsetting because you go in and you meet with a nephrologist and he's looking, this white haired nephrologist is looking at a piece of paper of the urinalysis or the blood analysis with all of this data. And they're looking at two or three numbers and the equations they put those numbers into are very basic and they're outdated. Right. So. Uh, I had my fair share of uh, discussion with nephrologists during my mother's stay and, and the doctor who was basically seeing my mother and and those are the kind of discussions i had I mean, uh, so so i think when i was with my mother there was nothing to do for me so what i did was i pulled up uh, whatever i can find on internet all the people who had the acute kidney failure and they're basically all the uh, wherever i can find the data and then i i basically correlated with uh, with my mother's symptoms and, and the data that we have collected over her uh, all the tests that happened in in last three months six months and uh, it was very clear to me when i was in the hospital that you know her she was very close to the end of life and uh, i was talking with the nephrologist and i was saying that you know uh, what i see and what i can understand from the data and and what i can uh, understand from living with my mother uh, is that we should have an end of life discussion and the doctor the nephrologist was telling me no 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 she'll be okay she will start running i will make her you know get out of the bed and she will walk and leave this hospital and i was like okay we are not talking we, we are not talking even in the same language what i'm i'm discussing and so i said no i want my my mother to be released tomorrow morning and i i, I had her released uh, and then when i was taking her you know the the nurses came to me they said uh, they said we don't know how you made the decision but uh, you made a really good choice taking your mother home because we live in the hospital we have seen enough people who come here 
for diagnose and for the treatment, but they leave that. So he said, even if you know that she's, you know, uh, there's a, uh, the life is, is not that far out stretch for her, uh, giving her comfort at home is, is a really good thing because she's in severe pain and, and she was always in pain crying 24 uh, seven. So, so I think uh, I see that doctors, they look at very small amount of data because they are so specialized on a certain uh, disease that they don't see beyond that. And, and, and I said that if I can come to that conclusion, you can come to the same conclusion, but you are not taking it, telling me the reality because you are, you are treating not hundreds, but thousands of people a year. So you know that, you know, a particular person, how, what is the longevity and what is happening, but uh, you are giving me a, a fake, uh, you know, uh, advice, but basically in the sense that uh, I know what is going to happen and you're not telling me it is going to happen. And, and that, I think that really disturbed me and, and so forth. And uh, so I think I'm, I will keep working on this. Yeah, well, it's it's such a... It... It's such a great problem to work on because a lot of times you think of data and accuracy. You need to make your your drilling models more accurate. And with what we're talking about, what you're talking about, the impact is in lives. Like literally, like the number of days people can live longer and the number of right. lives you can save with early detection. So it's I feel like it's the highest bar when it comes to the types of problems we could work on with data. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that's where I... I personally feel like the biggest impact for for uh, AI uh, in, in my perspective that if there is a biggest impact that uh, 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 all these technologies under the umbrella of AI that are being realized right now and more to be developed in coming future I think they will have they should have the biggest impact on the people and in and improving the quality of life of people and and to me that is that is the part of the intelligent future where basically you are developing technologies which are helping people of from all lives and of all ages and of all races around the globe and you can make something meaningful uh contribution to people's life and i think that's where i believe that is from my perspective, that's where I think that AI's biggest contribution will be as we move into the future. Do you do you think in the future we'll have something like, I know this is a little gross, but it's really helpful, something like a smart toilet? So imagine it actually does the urinalysis right there every day for everyone in your household. So if there's anything strange, you would catch it immediately and Go on a diet. Yeah, I, mean, what, yeah, I think there is nothing far fetched, right? When it comes to if you have to think from the perspective of uh, of diagnosing something and diagnosing something, but I think uh, something like that, I don't see it as a far fetched. It, it can be a possibility, right? People cannot move; someone has to take them somewhere. And if someone comes up a smart device which can do the you know urinal analysis and 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 some of those analysis, yeah, why not? I would say. Yeah, I, I've got a fun question here coming from the video team: Is a colony <laughs> on Mars harder than a deep water colony of humans? Okay, uh, okay. So here's the thing, <laughs> and that uh, I, I, I'm glad you asked that because <laughs> see, see, and going to Mars is easier than going to the core of the Earth period there is, there is no debate about that so so i think uh, i think uh, going to mars is a easier problem i think the the deepest well we have drilled uh, i believe i can be wrong but it's i think it's close to maybe eight kilometers the the maximum we have tried to drill as humans so i think uh, and and I think it's more than 6,000 kilometers that's the radius of the Earth. So I would say that reaching to the core of the Earth is definitely more challenging and much more aspirational than going to Mars. Ashwani, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. I feel like I've learned um, a lot about your background, your story. I appreciate you sharing that. But then also your journey to Halliburton. Very fascinating. Thanks for the invitation. I really appreciate it.